Thank you to the Herbster family. That was beautiful, wasn't it? Praise the Lord for that. I am a member of the Worth Baptist Church, and I am so grateful to God for the leaders that God has brought to our church. Several years ago, when Dr. Weaver began to consider retirement, the Lord put upon his heart that the youth pastor would become the next pastor of the church. I don't know about you folks. For those of you who are Worth Baptist Church members, you know what I'm talking about. We are tremendously blessed. Pastor Tyler Gillett has an amazing heart for souls and for the lost. He also has an incredible gift of communication. He also has zeal and passion and enthusiasm and energy that make me very jealous. <laughs> Pastor Gillett, it is a joy to have you with us tonight. I look forward to you opening our conference. I'm, I'm just thrilled that my pastor is with us tonight. May God bless you and use you mightily, sir. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, go with me tonight to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. It is a great privilege for us to be able to host this meeting, to have so many Mount Abiram missionaries sent out from our church. For those of you that are visiting from out of town, welcome to Fort Worth, and welcome to Worth Baptist Church. If there's anything that I or my staff could do to serve you while you're here, we'd be happy to do that. If you need a restaurant recommendation or you'd like to have some fun activity during the afternoon or really just anything at all that we could do for you, we would love to do it. I'd like to ask my staff to go ahead and stand. If you're a member of our staff, would you stand? I want you to get to know these folks. And again, if there's anything that we can do for you this week, we are your servants and we would be honored to do that. And thank you so much, staff. Well, all day yesterday, Dr. Fielder gave me a hard time about my beard and about looking like Prince Harry. In fact, our dear Dr. Bill Patterson on our way out of church last Wednesday night said to me, before the beard, it was Opie Taylor. <laughs> and he wasn't being disrespectful. I've called myself Opie Taylor several times. He said, after the beard, it's Prince Harry, so you have to decide who you like better, Opie Taylor or Prince Harry. <laughs> I decided to stay Prince Harry for at least one more night so this could be a royal address. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. I thought about titling this message, How to Build the Wall. <laughs> well, in light of current events, because Nehemiah has nothing to do with politics or what's going on in our particular country and that issue, I thought I'd better give it another title. So we're going to call it tonight, How to Get the Job Done. <laughs> Nehemiah was a man who got the job done done. Now the first six chapters of the book of Nehemiah concern the construction of the wall of Jerusalem. The wall was initially destroyed in 586 BC when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem and destroyed it. In 539 BC Cyrus the Persian overthrew Babylon and in the first year of his reign he issued a decree permitting the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. It would be more than 15 years after those initial people returned under Zerubbabel before the temple would be completed. That puts the timeline at somewhere around 524 BC when the temple was finished. But the events of Nehemiah take place in 445 BC, almost a century after the first group of Jews returned the walls of Jerusalem were still lying in waste. History tells us that there was at least one attempt over the years to rebuild the walls, but they faced opposition, they grew discouraged, and they grew up, and they gave up. Now, the first seven chapters of Nehemiah tell the remarkable story of how God led the people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in only 52 days. Now imagine that. What had not been accomplished in almost a century was accomplished in only 52 days. 
I would imagine that in those 100 years there had been a lot of talk about rebuilding the walls, don't you? I think they probably had planning meetings and strategy sessions. I think people met over coffee. I'm sure they had a Starbucks in Jerusalem. They have them everywhere else. Year after year passed, people talked about a great problem, but they did nothing about it. Decades of inaction passed like sand passing through an hourglass. Generations lived and died, and almost a century went by before someone decided that grand talk was not enough, and it was time to act. That man was named Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a man of action. Study his life, he's a man of simplicity and godly sincerity. He doesn't make grand speeches that we read. In fact, by my count, he only speaks 811 recorded words in chapters 1 through 6. 352 of those words were spoken to God in prayer. He was not a man of talk. He was a man of action. Now that spoke to me because we live in a day when people like to talk about great problems. We love strategy sessions and planning meetings, especially at Starbucks. We love to raise awareness with our hashtags and our social media campaigns. Perhaps you remember the hashtag Stop Coney, K-O-N-Y. In March 2012, a charity released a YouTube video that aimed to raise awareness about the children that were being kidnapped by the thousands in Uganda, the Congo, and South Sudan. They were being kidnapped by a group called the Lord's Resistance Army, their leader, a man named Joseph Kony. The video encouraged viewers to make Kony infamous. And they were going to capture Kony by the end of 2012. And the way that they would do it is that people would post about those kidnapped children and about Joseph Kony on social media. Now, within days of the video's release, it was a viral success. It had been viewed 30 million times on YouTube. For one day, hashtag Stop Kony was the top trending topic on Twitter. But only five days after the video had been viewed 30 million times, the hashtag had all but disappeared from social media. Less than 500,000 people were viewing the video. Cultural critics have included that for all of the awareness and the social media outrage, the movement actually accomplished very little. And tragically, Joseph Coney and the LRA are still at large and they are still kidnapping children in that part of Africa. I was reminded that great problems are not solved by great tweeting. Great problems are not solved by great talking. Great problems are solved by people who reserve most of their talking for the Lord and most of their time for action. My goal tonight is to be simple, and to be short, and I think that's just how Nehemiah would have wanted it. So look at Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's read the first four verses. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Kislu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed, before the God of heaven. In chapters 1 and 2, Nehemiah takes five steps to get the job done. Step number one, he develops a burden. Nehemiah is in the capital city of Persia. He's there because it's his job to be there. He's a cupbearer to the king. 
The cupbearer was much more than a waiter that brought food to the king. He was in the inner circle of the king's most trusted advisors. He had the highest possible security clearance. Nehemiah is a man of influence and responsibility. We would think of him much like the president's chief of staff in our country. One day, Nehemiah is in the palace because it's his job to be there, and a delegation returns from Jerusalem. His brother was a member of that delegation, and Nehemiah simply asked him, what is the state of the people in Jerusalem, and what is the state of the city itself? You see, building always begins with a burden, but a burden usually begins with a question. If you're going to have a burden, you have to care enough to at least ask a question. And that's what Nehemiah did. They respond, the people are afflicted. They're a reproach. The walls are broken down. The gates are burned with fire. Now, folks, that wasn't breaking news. That was very old news. It had been that way for almost a century. Every Jewish person knew that information. But on this particular day, it wasn't old news for the king's cupbearer. The Bible tells us that this news broke Nehemiah. That he sat down on the marble floors of the palace and he wept. And over the next few months, he weeps. He fasts. He prays. The weeping shows that the burden impacted his emotions. The fasting shows that the burden impacted his body. The praying shows that it impacted his soul and his spirit. It all began with the man who developed a burden. It did not begin because he was entrusted with millions of dollars to get the job done. It did not begin because the people in Jerusalem said, we're a reproach and the walls are a mess. Nehemiah, won't you come and help us? It began because of one man in his heart developed a burden. He wasn't okay with news that was old to everyone else, and he was affected. It began with a burden. So the first thing he did was develop a burden. The second thing he did was pray about it. We read about it in verse 4. He prayed before the God of heaven. You see, if you can ask a question, you can get a burden. But what you do next is the most important part of the process. Nehemiah, after getting a burden, prayed about it. In fact, he prayed about it for four months. He got the burden sometime late in November, December. The prayer that's recorded at the end of chapter 1 takes place in April. So for four months, he's burdened about the condition of the people in Jerusalem. And day in and day out, he takes that burden to the Lord. If you'll study the prayer and it's worthy of study, you'll find that it has four components. There's praise in that prayer. There's repentance in that prayer. He says, I and my people have sinned against the Lord. He asked the Lord for some things and he yields himself to the Lord at the very end of the prayer. Now, I would like to imagine that at the beginning of those four months, his prayer sounded something like this. God, these people are your people. Jerusalem is your city. God, would you send a prophet to Jerusalem so the job could get done? God, would you send a priest or someone with building experience so the job can get done. God, there's a job that needs to be done. I'm not okay with how things are going. Send someone to build those walls. Send someone to inspire your people. I think Nehemiah began his, his, burden, his burden in prayer by praying for laborers. But as the months went by and he spent hours on his knees before the Lord, and the burden increased, Nehemiah began to understand that he was part of the answer to his prayer. His burden had become a calling, and his prayer changed from send someone to send me. Look at verse 11. He says, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant 
and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Who's the man? He tells you, for I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah says, I've been praying for four months that someone would do something. Today, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to see the king, and God, I'm begging you to prosper me. A burden says someone must do something, but a calling says I must do something. And it's interesting to me, Nehemiah didn't call himself. God called him as he took his burden to God in prayer. In chapter 2, verse 12, it said that God had put something in his heart. It all happened when he prayed. And so if we're going to get the job done... We've got to develop a burden. We've got to pray about the burden. Then look at chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. That's why I'm not sure Nehemiah was a good Baptist. Brother Bill asked you folks a moment ago if you enjoyed a cupcake. Only Baptist people wouldn't raise their hand and said they enjoyed a cupcake. Nehemiah had not here to here before time and sat in his presence, verse 2. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah had been praying probably long protracted prayers about this matter. He had had a season of prayer for four months. Here, as the king has asked him a question about this, about what should be done, about this burden in his heart, he sends up a quick text message prayer to God. In fact, the king probably didn't even know that Nehemiah had prayed. Aren't those wonderful prayers? He said, I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto him, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the rivers, that they may convey me over till I come unto Judah, and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. This is amazing. He says, King, if I found favor in your sight, I'd like to take some extended time off from this really important job handling national and international affairs to attend to a personal matter. What I'd like to do is build the walls of Jerusalem again. And I know that the building of the walls of a capital city of a once great nation might not be good policy for Persia, but I'd like to do it anyway. And if it would please the king, I'd also like for you to take some time to write me some letters so that no one harasses me when I pass over the river and I'll have safe passage. And I'd also like you to write another letter to get me the wood to build the wall, and I'd like you to pay for it. He developed a burden. He prayed about it, and he acted boldly. 
That's bold, isn't it? Imagine walking into your boss's office tomorrow and saying, I'd like to take six months off to go to work on a project for our competitor in Houston. I'd really like to have a company car to drive out there. And the project will cost a couple of million dollars, and they don't have the money, so I'd like you to pay for it. Who asked for something like that? I'll tell you who, someone who knows the good hand of his God is upon him. See, ladies and gentlemen, favor with man comes from favor with God. And that's how Nehemiah starts this whole thing. He says, if I found favor in your eyes. Favor, of course, is an Old Testament word for grace. Never forget that as believers, we have the favor of God through Jesus Christ. There's never anything we need to do to earn it. We have it. But it is in prayer that we become convinced of our favor with God and where we begin to feel His good hand upon our lives to accomplish His purposes. And it's in prayer where we get the boldness to act. It starts with a burden that pushes Him to His knees. He prays about it for four months, gets up off his knees, and acts boldly. That's how the job gets done. There's another thing he needs to do. He goes to Jerusalem. He takes a midnight tour of the damage of the town. And then in verse 17, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in. He's talking to all the leaders and people of Jerusalem. Ye see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hand for this good work. Here's the fourth thing you got to do to get the job done. You have to recruit co-laborers. He gets there. He sees the damage. He knows the job is much bigger than one man can do. So he gathers all the people around, and it's not real complicated. He says, folks, you see the mess we're in. You have eyes. You can see it. The walls are broken down. The problem is clear. The solution is simple. Let's rise up and build. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need a strategy session. Let's get the job done. Come and let us build. And the people say, well, we should have thought of that. Let's rise up and build. Now, the job was too big for Nehemiah. He needed some help to get it done. He lets them know about the problem, gives them a simple solution. They work together to get it done. Chapter 3 lists some of the co-laborers. I counted 52 individual or, individuals or groups that helped on the wall. Chapter 4 gives you the idea that most all the rulers, nobles, and people had a part. You see what's happened? What started as a burden in the heart of one man has multiplied exponentially and now hundreds, maybe even thousands of people are involved in the job. That's how the job gets done. Well, success invites opposition. Look at verse 19. But when Samballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Now, folks, wherever there's a great work going on for God, you can bet there will be a Samballat and a Tobiah to stand in the way. Paul said, there's a great and effectual door open unto me, and there are many adversaries. The last thing you have to do before the job gets done is persist persist. 
Nehemiah refused to be distracted or deterred from the good work God had called him to do. The good hand of God was upon him. The God of heaven would see it through. He persisted. And in 52 days, the job was done. Now, folks, this is a pattern that I see all through scriptures. I see it in the book of Daniel. A young man who had a burden to live for God in his captivity. That burden leads Daniel to pray. He spends most of the book on his knees in communion with God. From his prayer closet, he acts boldly. He turns down the king's meter. He interprets a dream nobody else can interpret, putting his neck on the liner. He gives bad news to Belshazzar. The Persians are coming tonight. He has a bird and he prays. He acts boldly. He recruits co-laborers. He knows he can't live for God in a pagan land alone, so he finds three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they serve the Lord together, and time and time again, they persist. And you come to the end of his life, and Daniel, sleeping in lion's dens, receiving some of the greatest prophetic visions anyone ever received, and letters go out all over the world written by pagan kings saying the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the God no one's able to deliver like him. One young man had a burden and he got the job done. I see it time and time again in the life of the Apostle Paul. Paul would go to a place and start a church. But when he went to a place and started a church, he would always have a burden for the next place. And so he would pray. And sometimes God would say, Paul, you go ahead and go on to that city. Sometimes God would say to Paul, no, Paul, this is in the right place. This time you go to another place. And when God said go, Paul would go. And when he said don't go, Paul wouldn't go. But once that burden had been refined through prayer and he had God's direction and he was sure that the hand of God was upon his life, he would act boldly. He would go to that new place, fearlessly proclaim Christ, and while he was there, he'd recruit co-laborers. He'd share his burden with a young man named Timothy, or guys like Aristarchus and Epaphras and Dr. Luke and Demas. And when he would begin to have success in a place, there would be great opposition, and he'd quit and go back to Antioch. No, he'd persist. The story of the New Testament is the story of a man with the good hand of God upon him and a burden for the Gentiles who would change the course of human history. Let me ask you a question. Are there any great problems in our day? <laughs> is there anything like those broken down walls of Jerusalem that bring reproach to God's name and to God's people today? Are there any jobs that need to be done? Well, there were over 2,500 abortions in America today. There are almost 29,000 children in foster care in the state of Texas today. Children that have been abused, neglected, children with eternal souls that will spend somewhere forever. And thousands of them need homes. But I think anyone with half a knowledge of the Word of God and a little bit of common sense would say by far the greatest problem in our day is the fact that 60% of the world has never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. The fact that there are 6,600 unreached people groups, 3,300 unreached, unengaged people groups. And as my friend Tim Lee says, the only thing worse than being lost is being lost with no one looking for you. Isn't it a reproach to the name of Christ and to most of the people in the church that many of the people in this world have Coca-Cola cell phones and high-speed internet, but they haven't yet heard of Jesus Christ? And isn't it a reproach that we've had 2,000 years with the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God, and the best news anyone has ever heard, and we still haven't gotten the job done? Now, that's old news to most people here, but there might be someone here who would say, I know it's old news, but it's not okay with me. What can I do about it? Well, here's what you could do. 
you could get a burden. You get a burden for some people group, a burden for some nation that doesn't have access to the gospel. And a burden usually starts with a question. And you'll get a burden and you'll have no idea how to reach those people from Fort Worth, Texas or from wherever you live. But you'll know someone that does. And you'll get down on your knees and you'll unload that burden to the Lord. And as you pray, God may change your burden into a calling. You may begin by saying, send somebody. But as you pray and fast and weep, God may say, I need to send you. Maybe God doesn't send you to that place permanently, but He encourages you to keep praying that He would send somebody. After you pray, whether it's to go long term or to give sacrificially or to go on a short term trip, He'll tell you to act boldly. And here's the thing about a burden when it's really a burden, you won't be able to keep it to yourself. You'll start recruiting co laborers. You'll start praying for others and, and sharing the great need in a place with other people. And as you get a burden, and as you pray, and as you act, and as you recruit, you'll be attacked. Every missionary in this room, this is how their life has gone. They got a burden. They prayed. They acted. They went somewhere and recruited co laborers, and they were attacked. And by God's grace, they just keep persisting. And it's a very simple message. I'm here to tell you that if enough people would do that, we'd get the job done. If enough people would do more than talk about it, more than write articles about it, and by the way, we need to talk about it, we need to write articles about it, but we must do more. If somebody here would get a burden, if enough of us would get a burden, we could get the job done. I want to remind you tonight, the Great Commission is not impossible. It's inevitable. And one day a generation of Christians will arise and they'll do more than talk about it. They'll reach the world. I just want to say, I want to be part of that generation. Do you have a burden tonight? If you don't, that's not because there's a shortage of places that need somebody to have a burden. So as we start the meeting, let's start there. Father, thank you for Nehemiah's example for giving us a pattern of how the job gets done. And yes, it's simple. It's always been simple. I'm glad it's simple because that means someone like me can be involved in it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.